Uh, hey, turn with me to Luke chapter 8. Um, I want to make a bit of a confession to you people this morning and I don't want to talk myself up and make it sound like I'm something awesome and great. I don't do that. Uh, I'm a humble sort of a man. But I do want to say this. On uh, Who loves my wife? Who thinks my wife's a great woman? I, I do too. I think she's a wonderful woman. Uh, but I want you to know this. The only reason you're meeting her is because I've saved her life. I have saved this woman's life on many, many and numerous occasions. Let me explain to you. Anyone like to go shopping? Anyone ever go to a city and you're walking and, and there's these things in, in cities called roads. Do you know that? There are things called roads. Now, what, 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 what lives on a road? What generally happens on a road? Vehicles travel on roads, sometimes at high speeds, sometimes low speeds, but even a vehicle at a low speed could take you out. How many of you, when you were brought up and you, one of the first things we learned about roads was what? Look left, look right, look left again. Yes, not look straight ahead at the sales sign on the other side of the road. That's not good practice. So I can't tell you the amount of times that I have saved this woman's life when we have been shopping. She gets fixated on things. So she should be watching her road, but what she's doing is she sees this big 20-foot red sales sign on the other side of the road. And she can't wait to get there because in the, the five or ten seconds it might take to wait for the car, the sale could end. So she's just got to get there and she takes off for the sales and I've got to grab a tacky, come back, whoosh. Car goes past, truck goes past. Watch the road, Jackie. Trams at the Gold Coast. Or maybe it's, 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 it's a woman's dress. She'll, she'll see a woman and you'll get fixated on this beautiful dress that another lady has on. And so she'll all of a sudden focus on a woman's dress and she's looking at that and she just keeps walking like a robot. And I've got to grab her, come back, Jackie, and I'll save her life in the truck goes past again or maybe it's a pair of shoes sometimes it'll be the woman in front of her and she'll have nice shoes and instead of looking where she's going she'll be looking at the shoes and then she'll want to talk about the shoes tell Chloe how beautiful the shoes are or say to me do you like those shoes Alan and as she's doing that I've got to grab a jacket and get back whoosh car goes past I've saved her life on many many occasions because she loses her focus so easily when we go shopping she loses her focus and she gets easily distracted how many else know people like that? Who knows people like that? They get easily distracted. They're on a task, on a journey. She's on a path. We're doing something. We're going somewhere. But she gets easily distracted. And those distractions could very literally, if she had married a lesser in tune man, if she had married a less focused man, a less determined man, a less loving man, a less self-sacrificial man, she may not be here today. Did you pray for me this morning? You should. Lack of focus can cost you your life. How many, how many times have we read in the, in the paper? A lack of focus causes car accidents. People get distracted with a mobile device. Or they get distracted by looking at something else other than where they're going. I think relationships can break down because we get distracted. We get too focused on work maybe and we neglect our husbands, our wives or our children. We get too focused on, maybe we get too focused on somebody else at work. And, 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 and there can be a, a whole bunch of things that can happen. And relationships can be damaged by distraction. Lives can be lost by distraction. A lot of things can happen when we get distracted. How many of you know that your faith walk is a journey? And that your spiritual side of life is taking you somewhere? Those of you that are in this room now that believe in Jesus Christ, those of you that, that believe that God is real, those of you that believe that Jesus taught us the way that we should live, that, that when He came, He not only died for our sins, but He gave us some great instruction. It, it's, it's like reading the manual for life. Who's, who's got a DVD player at home or an iPhone or a Samsung and you are not getting the most out of it because you just simply won't read the manual? Hate manuals. I just want to turn it off, turn it on. How do I charge it? That's it. My phone could probably do a plethora of things. A plethora of things. But I don't know. I only know this much because I can't be bothered reading a manual. I hate it. I've got a DVD player at home. I still don't know how it works. I just know if I push that button, it turns on. And so I push that button, it turns on. But there's so many more things I could be doing with it. I could be getting so much more out of life if I would just read the instructions, the manual, and work out how this thing works. Well, I think Jesus gave us a whole bunch of instruction about life. He, he told us how we should be focused, what our values should be. He taught us what we should be focused on in life. He taught us what our priorities should be and so on. He, he taught us what our focus should be in life. 
and, and so many people, and I'm and, and including people that are sitting in gatherings this morning who've just sung what a beautiful name it is, are not getting everything out of that life because they're still not prioritizing and focusing in the right areas of life. We get distracted. And our faith journey can also end up in shipwreck because of distraction in the same way that you could physically end up in shipwreck because of distraction. Jesus actually talked a lot about distraction. And I'm planting this thought in your head today. So I bet you when you start reading, uh, say, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John again, you're going to see lots of bits and pieces there where Jesus is actually talking about this simple little thing called distraction. We're not called to live distracted lives. So if you weren't here last week, um, jump on YouTube, whatever, and listen to, to the message or iTunes, wherever it is. Because last week we talked about distraction. We, we, we have this saying in today's society that we're time poor. And the truth is, if we're honest, we are not time poor because we make time for the most important things. We're not time poor. We're just more distracted than any generation has ever been because of opportunity and the speed of everything and the, 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 the instant gratification and cell phones and Netflix. and so We are just so distracted with life now. Our problem is not a lack of time. It's a lack of focus. It's the fact that we are distracted. And for many, many people, their spiritual lives are suffering because of this same thing, distraction. Jesus speaks about this in Luke chapter 8, verse 11 to 15. Here's what he says. He's just told them a parable. He talked about the parable of the seed and the sower. Everyone know that story? A farmer goes out, he's got seed, and he sows this seed. And he talks about the four different types of soil where the seed lands. And then the disciples go, we don't get this. How many of you, how many of you ever heard something Jesus said and gone, I don't get it, I don't get it. I do it all the time, I don't get it. Well, this is one of those very rare moments where he says, dummies, I'm going to explain it to you. I'm going to break it down and make it as simple as I can. And here's the explanation that Jesus gives. He says, this is the meaning of the parable. The seed is the word of God. Those along the path are the ones who hear. And then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts so they may not believe and be saved. I just read that this morning and I thought, wow, isn't that awesome? Even though they don't believe and get saved, the devil couldn't stop the word of God from going in. So be encouraged, those of you that uh, are sharing uh, what you believe God is saying with people, those of you that are raising children, um, those of you that are, uh, are sharing your faith with people, be encouraged. It says here that the devil couldn't stop the word of God going in. Yes, he snatched it away so that they wouldn't believe, but they still heard it, he says in this parable. They're still hearing it. Because you can't stop the power of the Word of God. God's words are powerful. When God speaks, people hear. I'll guarantee people in this room, you have heard God speak. There are a lot of people that go, oh, I've never heard God speak. Yes, you have. You just don't recognize the voice of God yet. So we need to learn to recognize the voice of God. But Jesus is saying here that, that the, the first group of people, he says that they hear the Word and then the devil comes, he takes away the Word from their hearts so they may not believe and be saved. What's happening here is the goal is that they don't start walking with God in the first place. That's what's happening. This group of people, the goal is that they wouldn't start walking with God in the first place anyway. Then he moves on and explains the second type of soil. And he says that those on the rocky ground are the ones who receive the word with joy when they hear it, but they have no root. They believe for a while. So these guys are actually believing for a little bit. They, they, they're going, yep, Jesus, amen. What a beautiful name. What a wonderful name. Here I am to worship. They're doing all that stuff. It says, but in a time of testing, they fall away. So what's the goal here? They don't stay walking with God. So the first group don't start walking with God. The second group, they start walking, but they don't stay walking with God. Because when time of pressure and testing comes, they, they pull back. Because how many of you know, when you come to Jesus, life becomes absolutely perfect? What are you laughing at? Haven't you heard that message? Come to Jesus. I remember when I was living in India and I used to go into a slum area with this uh, um, uh, African pastor that came across to India and he wanted to plant churches. So we said, well, come on in and we'll do some preaching and get an interpreter and then you can start these churches. And we would share the good news of Jesus and then he would get up at the end and he would say to these poor villages in slum areas of India, he would say this to them, come to, if you want money, come to Jesus, he'll give you money. If you want happiness, come to Jesus. He'll give you happiness. He'll make you happy all the time. If you want a husband or a wife, come to Jesus. And he just basically listed every single hook that every human being wants. And he said to them, come to Jesus and you are guaranteed that you will get this. Well, you can understand what happens when people hear that. They come to faith and then they realise, oh, guess what? I kicked my toe and it still hurt. I thought I'd be magically void of pain. You know, uh, I, I thought that nothing bad would happen to me. I didn't think that my, my I, I thought my bank balance was like the Tim Tam packet in the ad. You know, the ad where she takes a Tim Tam out and keeps coming back. I'll just keep spending, having a good time. And oh, hang on, I've got no money to pay the phone bill. 
Bad things don't happen to Christians. Yes, they do. Yeah, they do. We're not devoid of pain, but we've got a God that walks with us through the midst of the pain, amen? So the first group, they don't start walking with God. The second group, they don't stay walking with God. And then there's a third group. The seed that fell among thorns stands for those who hear, but as they go on their way, they are choked by life's worries, riches, and pleasures, and they do not mature. The first group don't start walking with God. The second group don't stay walking with God. This group start walking and they stay, but their whole journey is devoid of maturity. It doesn't say they fall away. It doesn't say they stop walking. It says they're walking with him. They begin this journey. But what happens, it says the cares, uh, pleasures and the riches and the worries of life and all this stuff, it says they choke out the maturity. They choke the life. And you know what I reckon? I reckon that probably one of the biggest problems in Western Christianity anyway is that most of the people sitting in gatherings, so many of us, fit into that third category. We're not the ones that didn't start walking with God. We did. That's why we're doing what we're doing. And for many of us, we're no longer the ones that fall away when it gets pressure. We didn't stop walking with God. We've been through pain. Who's been through times of trial and pain in this room right now? I know some of your stories. I know you've gone through stuff. You've gone through the ringer, but, you've, you, but what you've done is it's built your faith. It's solidified your decision to follow Jesus and you've stuck with him. So you're not the people that didn't start. You're not the people that stopped, but so many of us get choked. We get choked. The life of our faith gets nullified, becomes null and void. As a matter of fact, that, that, that word there, uh, that word there choked. Remember last week we were talking about the two things that distraction does. Number one, distraction, it starves focus. And the second thing distraction does is it feeds frustration. So we've got to focus. These people have got to focus and they want to walk with God and they're walking with God. But then distractions come. Distractions come. And all of a sudden, that walk with God is choked. It's stifled. We're still walking, but we're not going to make it to a place of maturity. Why are we not going to make it to a place of maturity? Well, Jesus makes it very clear because of the power of distraction. He says, these people are walking with me. They're going with me. Well, what happens? Distraction comes along. What does the distraction come along in the form of? It comes in the form of worry, it comes in the form of riches, and it comes in the form of pleasure. Jesus is here talking about a distracted spiritual walk. What happens when we allow our spiritual journey to get distracted by focusing on things that we were never called to focus on in the first place? Matthew 6.33, Jesus gives us our life's priority. If you follow Jesus in this room and you really adhere to his teachings, Matthew 6.33, Jesus made this statement. He said, seek, seek second. Sorry, I got it wrong, did I? First, sorry, my wife always corrects me. Seek first, what? Kingdom of God and his righteousness. But you know the beautiful thing, what does he say will happen if you do that? All these other things, they'll be added to you. So, 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 so all the things that you think worry and riches and pleasure, the things you think they will fix, the things you think that they will somehow allow you to bring into your world. He says, you know what? If you seek me first, if you live an undistracted spiritual life, he says, here's my commitment to you. All these other things that you need will fall into place. They'll come to you. Now, that doesn't mean that you're going to get rich and have the biggest house on the hill and seven cars. It doesn't mean that. What it means, though, at this point in time is if that's what you think happiness is, if you turn your attention to focusing on him, then he will reveal why you want that, why you think that. He'll deal with you. Maybe he'll give it to you. Maybe he won't. Maybe he'll change you instead so that instead of wanting all of that, you'll want something else. I think it's, uh, is it Psalm 37, 4, somewhere around there? It says, it's, it, it says, delight yourself in the Lord. He will give you the desires of your heart. Delight yourself in the Lord. He'll give you the desires of your heart. What does that mean? It doesn't necessarily mean delight yourself in the Lord and he'll give you whatever it is that your heart wants right now. What he's saying is if you delight yourself in God, I'll give you the very desires. All of a sudden you'll begin to desire different things in your heart. The actual desire itself is what I'll give you. And guess what? When God gives you a desire for something, nothing's going to stop it. Nothing's going to stop it. Because God put the desire in there for this thing. Right now, many of us, we've got desires for all kinds of things, mainly 
partly, possibly, because God's not first. We're not seeking the kingdom first. We're still seeking a whole bunch of other things. Jesus says that distraction is so powerful that it can literally stop your spiritual walk from coming to maturity. Who wants to be a mature believer here? Who wants to go on that journey to maturity? If I was to ask you physically right now, how many of you want to continue to mature and continue to grow? Everybody's hand would go up. I'm hoping. (laughs) And if it didn't go up, eh. well, spiritually, it's no different. There's a progression of growth and maturity that God wants us to have and a journey that he wants us to walk down. But Jesus says here, you can be easily distracted from that. And he gives us the three big distractions to our journey to maturity. Distraction number one, he says, it's worry. Distraction number one is worry. Let me say this first, worry is not a sin, it's a distraction. I've heard people preach and say worry is sin. I disagree with that. I think we all think about things. Who thinks about things during the day? And sometimes when you think about things, your thoughts go up, and, 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 but every now and then you think about something and then you find your brain gets a little bit distracted, a little bit pulled away from here, and you start maybe thinking about that thing a little bit too much. Maybe you're trying to work it all out. Maybe the emotions get involved and so on. You step across a line from thinking about something to worrying about something. If that happens to you and it happens to me, I want you to know this worry is not a sin. Don't come under condemnation because you worry. Worry is part of the human experience. Unfortunately, we do it. But the closer we get to God, the more we step out in faith, the more we trust Him, the more experiences we have where He comes through, the more we begin to understand who He is. We trust more and more and more and worry can dissipate in areas of our life. But it comes because we've stuck by with God and we've taken things to God and he's answered prayers. So instead of worrying about that as it is now, I'm more excited about the fact that I know he's going to change that because I've been there, done that, and I've got the T-shirt. Worry is not a sin. Jesus said worry is a distraction. It's a distraction. If I could define worry, worry is an incorrect spiritual posture. Now, I'm going to, look, I'm looking around the room right now, Theo, we've already done this, I'm going to do it again. Look how Theo's sitting right now. It's so bad for you, Theo, you're slouching, your bottom's right down like that. You keep doing that and it's going to ruin your back, son, I've been telling you for years. Um, There are so many other people, look at the people left and right of you. Who's actually sitting up with a good posture in their chair? Who's sitting in a bad posture in their chair? We've all got different kinds of natural postures. And if you sit in the right posture, that's going to be really, really good for you. And it's going to help your body uh, rest the way that it was made and so on. It's going to help your development. You sit in the bad posture, it's going to uh, crush your development. It's going to slow down your development. It's going to deform the way your spine is a little bit. It's not going to be good for you, bottom line. And worry is a little bit like an incorrect spiritual posture. That's how I see worry. Worry tries to posture us away from God. It tries to posture you away from God. You're trying to walk this journey. You're trying to grow in maturity. But worry is trying to pull you away to think about a whole bunch of other things. And what generally tends to happen with worry is I'm thinking about that thing devoid of God in the middle of it. That's why I'm worrying. All of a sudden, I've got to work it out. I've got to have a plan. I've got to to be smart enough to... And so worry is a posturing. It's an incorrect spiritual posture that pulls us away from God. But here's the beautiful thing. Worry doesn't have to pull us away from God. Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 and 7 says this. It says, Do not be anxious about anything. That sounds like worry to me. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation. So don't be anxious about anything. Think about what you're anxious about right now. Whatever it is that you're worrying about, whatever it is that's distracting you from focusing first on the kingdom of God, think about that thing. And here's a word from God to you right now. Be anxious about nothing. But in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding. Worry is an incorrect spiritual posture. My mind is a bit twisted, and that's why I'm over here worrying. And, And God says, when you bring those things to me and learn to trust me, instead of your brain worrying, he said, you get filled with this peace that passes understanding. I can't understand why I feel peaceful about that situation. Because in the natural, it just looks like A, B, C, D. But because I've brought it to God and I've put God in that picture, God has come through. And even if he hasn't answered it yet, he's filled my mind with peace. That's, that's God's way of saying, hey, it's okay, I've got this. You're not walking this journey alone. I'm with you. I can see it, but I can see some things about that that you can't see right now. And maybe in time, I'll show it to you. Maybe in time, I'll change the situation. Maybe in time, I'll change you. But just trust me and walk with me. Let your worries be something that point you to God, not something that point you away from God. 
in, in the parable of the soil, this particular man allowed worry to be a distraction that pulled him away from God and stunted his spiritual maturity. But Jesus says you don't have to do that. Like you can't stop worry. It's going to happen at times. But here's what you do when you worry. You bring it to me. And you let me replace the worry with peace. Bring it to me. Let worry point you to God, not be a distraction that drags you away from God. The second distraction he talks about is riches. Jesus says riches can be a distraction. In Matthew chapter 6, I love this verse, 19 to 20, Jesus says this. He says, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moths and vermin destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. Now let me say something. He's not saying don't store up treasures. He's not, this is not an admonition to poverty. Okay, I'm not saying that you should all go home, sell your houses, sell your cars, give it all away to become more like Jesus. Okay? I'm not saying you shouldn't have a job. I'm not saying you shouldn't want a promotion. I'm not saying you shouldn't have a goal to get a better car. I'm not saying you shouldn't have a desire to get a better house. I'm not saying you shouldn't want to go on an overseas holiday. And I don't think Jesus is saying any of that. What Jesus is saying here, he's giving you a reason. Here's why you shouldn't store up treasure in heaven. Now, what he's saying is store up for yourself treasure in heaven. He's saying don't put your faith and your trust and everything in the things that you have here because moth. And rust and vermin will destroy it. In other words, everything here is temporal and it's not worth you putting your whole life into. It's not worth investing your whole life into accumulating things that are temporal when your life is eternal. Your life is eternal. Your body is temporal. Can I get an amen? Is there anyone giving me a bigger amen? I'm amening that. See, this belly that you guys have been watching slowly shrink for the last few weeks is temporal. I know that because I'm doing things and I'm investing in things that are going to make sure that this temporal thing here becomes less and less temporal and disappears. But one day, it doesn't matter how tricked or terrific I make this body look, one day it's not going to be. It's going to disappear. But God is eternal. And what I do for God is sow seeds for eternal difference. What I can do with the treasure I have here on earth is one of two things. I can either live to invest it all into me. And that's what Jesus says here. Don't store up for yourselves treasures here on earth. Nothing wrong with having some stuff for yourself. He's not saying that. But he's saying don't store up, don't don't have an attitude down here. All my treasures are for me in this temporal world. No, no, no. God gives me a chance to get involved in kingdom things as well. God gives me a chance to invest into the lives of other people. God gives me a chance to use my physical possessions and my wealth and so on to do something that will help point another human being to the reality and the love of Jesus Christ. If they connect up with Him, they too will realise that one day everything they have is temporal. But God is eternal and their life will go on eternally with Him. I don't think there's anything more important in life, if we truly believe what Jesus taught, than to do what we can with this time we've got. Look at, the, look at that crack in the wall there, guys. I, I, I do this all the time. That crack in the wall, that's your life. I'd hate to be, I'm not meaning to be a Debbie Downer. I'm just saying, eternity is, say, the start of the wall to the end of the wall, even though it's beyond that. My life here is that crack in a wall. That's it. God is going to do things with or without me. He's going to do things before I came and after I leave. But He gives me this beautiful invitation and says, while you're down here breathing the air I'm giving you, why don't you get involved in what I'm doing? Why don't you get involved in what I'm doing? Jesus is not saying He can't have things. What He's saying is, why would you spend your whole life getting temporal things that you just want to keep for yourself that are going to rust, be destroyed and disappear anyway? What's new today is old in a month. Who's found that out? Who's bought a brand new pair of shoes? And you've just gone, man, look at the shoes. These are awesome. How cool am I? Look at my kicks, as Ruth would say. And you polish them and you don't let the tiniest raindrop on them. You've got umbrellas on your shoes so they don't get wet when you're coming into church. Things like that. You so loved them. And then a month later, what? When you first got them, you were putting them on a stand. You took them off. You didn't put them in the other shoes. You put them on a stand in your bedroom, you know, almost like an altar, and you worship these shoes. But then eventually after a month, you just take them off and you just throw them in the cupboard with all the other shoes. That shirt that was so beautiful, (laughs) that shirt that was so wonderful. By the way, I saw a beautiful shoe altar. Ruth, you should show people the shoe altar you built for Daniel's shoes. I think it looks fantastic. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust and vermin and so on. He says, store up for yourselves treasure in heaven. Because what you do for heaven and what you do for the kingdom, he said, nothing's going to take that away. Nothing's going to take that away. I don't want to be distracted by riches. I don't want riches to be something that pull me away 
from spiritual maturity and pull me away from God. I want, I want my riches to be something that I can take to God and contribute to what God is doing and get involved in what God is doing. problem with people who chase riches is that they end up chasing the wrong thing. They're chasing something temporal and it pulls them away from God and it pulls them away from involvement in what God is wanting to do in their generation, in their community, in their time. Amen? First distraction is worry. Second distraction is riches. And then Jesus talks and he says that the third distraction is pleasure. The third distraction is pleasure. Again, let me say this. You know what? There's nothing wrong with having a good time. Nothing wrong with having a good time. Uh, at Christmas time, there's no greater joy to a parent. And anyone that's been a parent or had nephews or nieces, you would know what I mean. No greater joy. Then you go around and you find the perfect gift for those children and you get that gift. And then at Christmas or birthday, you give it to them and they open that thing up and they are so excited about that gift. Anyone, anyone enjoy that, that moment? And then they take that present and they play with it and they just, just go nuts over that present and, 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 and enjoy that thing. No, there's no greater joy, I think, to a parent than to see my children enjoying the things that I've given to them. Here's the good news. God's given you life, amen? And he wants you to enjoy it. He's not out to, to take away your fun and kill your life. What he's trying to do, if anything, is say, you know what, you can have the, this most amazing life, but here's the way it works best. So often we think it works this way best. Why? Because that's what the world says. That's what popular culture says. That's what my peer group says. That's what TV show says. That's what this says. And so we try all this, but we, we, we never quite get there. There's always this nagging thing on the inside where we keep looking for more and more, but we keep looking that way. Come over here to God. Come over here to God. He's offering you such an amazing life. So there's nothing wrong with pleasure. Nothing wrong with pleasure at all. But when pleasure pulls you away from God, when your pursuit of pleasure, you know, we live in a, a, a generation, uh, psychologists put it this way. They would say that man basically has two primary drivers. One is the pursuit of pleasure and the second is the avoidance of pain. And if you think about that, in this current generation, it's quite possible, and I'm not a doctor, psychologist, I'm none of those things, I'm just saying, throwing a thought out there. Maybe our pursuit of pleasure is tightly wrapped up with the incredible avoidance of pain. We don't want pain because we're living in a world today where we're being told you don't really have to experience pain anymore. We can do anything. You can be whatever you want, do whatever you want, and so on. And so we try so hard to avoid pain, we dive into pleasure. And now we've got this thing called instant gratification. You can just press a button. You can just turn on a switch. You can do whatever. And we want pleasure instantly. You know, we love picking up our mobile phones. Uh, um, um, neuroscientists have, have, have found the, the dopamine in the brain that, that when your Facebook thing goes ping, you get a shot of dopamine in your head. And so you, that's why you have to pick that thing up. It's, it's, not, it's, a, it's, it's a, an addiction. Just like, it's serious, it's an addiction, just like alcohol addiction and drug addiction, people are addicted to mobile devices because of that instant gratification, that instant uh, set of, of, of pleasure that we get when we do that. You know, we, I think we've lost, in the midst of that world, I wonder whether we've lost the pleasure of discipline, the pleasure of a disciplined life. How many people completed a university degree here in this room? Hands up if you've done a university degree. Yep, I'll bet you, you absolutely loved it. The night before an exam, Pauline, night before an exam, and your friends were all going out, but you had to knuckle down two o'clock in the morning. You're still doing the books, the exams at eight o'clock, and you were just going high fiving them as they walked in the room from their parties. You were loving life, weren't you? No, you were disciplining yourself. Why? Because you realised that, that, that the gratification of getting that, that, that degree at the end, it was going to be worth the discipline of doing what had to be done to achieve that goal or to get to that place in the end. It was going to be worth it. You were focused on something beyond just the now. You know, I think that's what, what God wants for his people too. I don't think God wants us just focused on this temporal world. If this is all there is to life. You know, 19 years of age, 19 years of age, I woke up in a caravan with my mates and, and we'd been out and had a big night and they were all laying, I had a, a friend of mine asleep on the kitchen table, a friend of mine asleep on the, 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 the bench in, in the caravan, another guy's on the floor and so on. And, 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 and I woke up and I sat up in my bed and I heard a voice so loud inside of me. And I said, if this is all there is to life, Alan, why don't you end it? 19 years of age. If this is all there is, all the things that you're doing, what I thought was freedom, doing whatever I wanted, when I wanted, because I wanted. And all that freedom did was lead me to a place to realise that none of those things are meeting that deepest place in my heart. I needed there, I needed a, 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 there's something about a restricted life with boundaries. And, and, and the truth is, that's what God offers us. But the freedom is found in the boundaries, not when the boundaries are torn down. Confusion and frustration reigns when there's absolutely no boundaries in life. Pleasure, he says, pleasure can be a distraction. He finishes the parable in Luke 8, 15, he says, but the seed on good soil 
He said, this seed stands for those with a noble and good heart who hear the word, retain it, and by sitting back and doing absolutely nothing, produce a great crop. No? it's not what it says? No, that's exactly not what it says. It says, the good soil stands for those with a noble and good heart who hear the word, retain it, and by persevering. What does he mean by persevering? What he's saying is this, by not allowing themselves to get distracted by the worries, by the riches, and by the pleasures of life. Those people go on and they bear fruit to maturity. They're the ones, that word maturity, it, it's the same word used when a, a woman's pregnant with a baby. And she goes through this process of looking after and doing the right things. And then, and then at the end of it, the joy of that baby actually coming and being born and brought into the world. That process is, is maturity. It, it's, it's also used agriculturally of a tree that, that's producing fruit. And there's a tree there and all the natural resources and everything coming into that tree and going down that branch and down that vine to that little bud on the end there and feeding it the right stuff at the right time, getting into it till bang that apple or that orange or whatever it is pops out on that tree or that egg. I only said that to see if you're listening. Eggs don't grow on trees, people. Chickens produce eggs. Nobody was listening whatsoever. The difference between a fruitful and unfruitful Christian life is in our ability to remain focused and avoid distractions. I wonder in this room here this morning, I wonder if there's any people and you haven't started the journey. You're the first soul. You've never started that journey with Jesus. Maybe there are some people here and you started, but you didn't keep going. You stopped. You were the one that when the pressures and that came, you stopped. Daniel, I'll get you guys up. I want to finish with a song this morning. Get the band back up. We'll finish with a song. Maybe, maybe you're the one that started, but then the pressure came and you got turned away or you dropped your bundle. You walked away from God because of peer pressure or because of a sickness or because of an unanswered prayer or something that didn't happen. Let, let me just remind those people here. I want to remind those people of one thing this morning. Our faith exists not because of how I feel. It doesn't become real because of an answered prayer. It all hinges on a man 2,000 years ago who was crucified, buried, and resurrected. It doesn't matter what happens to me today or how I feel. None of it's going to erase the historical fact that Jesus Christ lived, taught certain things, and that there were claims made by people that, that at the time weren't necessarily following him, by the way. They ran when he was crucified. But those same people went on and, and ended up dying because they were so convinced. We saw him after his death. That's the basis of my faith, not a feeling, not an answered prayer. Maybe you're here and you started with him, but you just didn't continue, you stopped off. I'm going to say there's probably a lot of people here too. You're like the third one. You got distracted. You know God's got a plan for your life and you've got a genuine passion for him. You love God and you want to follow God and you want everything that God wants you to have. Your heart's good, your head's in the right place and so on. But you are constantly distracted. You're distracted by worry. Instead of letting worry be something that you take to God, that draws you to God, that postures you towards Him, you allow worry to take you away. Distraction, losing traction. It's like your mind and your life loses traction. You're on a journey heading somewhere with God, but you're losing traction because of worry. Or maybe it's riches. Maybe you've bought into the lie that that money is going to give you something you can't have without it. Maybe you've bought into the lie that marriage will give you something you can't have without a life partner. Maybe you've bought into the lie that the promotion will give you something in here that you can't have without it. How do you know if pursuing something is good or bad? I always think that's a good sign. Whatever you want to get, wherever you want to land when you get there, if you think you can't get it till you get there, maybe you're chasing the wrong thing. Jesus said, seek me first. Seek me first. I'll change your heart. I'll change your life from the inside out, not the outside in. Distracted by worry distracted by riches. Maybe you're distracted by pleasure. Maybe you're distracted by pleasure as well. You know why I don't read my Bible in the morning? I just don't feel like I get anything out of it. I don't want to go to church because I could be doing something better with that time. I don't want to invest into my walk with God. I don't want to worship. Why? Because I don't get an instant dopamine hit. I don't get an instant rush. Let me tell you something. The best things in life that grow out of you will grow out of discipline. I read my Bible every day, not because it sets my world on fire, but because I know that every day 
I'm putting something in. I'm putting something in. I'm putting something in. I'm putting something in. I'm, something in. I'm building healthy habits into my life. And I know that at the right time, that I'm going to produce a harvest. I'm going to produce fruit. There's maturity taking place in my life. If I sat here and I watched Adele from the day she was born, when she was probably that big, and I just stared at her with my eyes open for the 70, 80 years of her life, I'll bet you I wouldn't have noticed her grow. 78. Did I say 80? 78, did I? Well, you look a sprightly 65 in my view. Point, point, 88. Wow, that's amazing. Look how fantastic she looks, 88. Point is this, if I sat there staring at my children, I wouldn't notice the growth. If I sat there, I'd just be staring at them and after two days, I'd go, this is pointless. They're not even growing. I'd throw them out. It's not happening straight away. I'm not seeing anything. I ate an apple once and look at me. Don't eat healthy people. It does nothing for you. You'll just get fat anyway. Huh? No, no, no. But we chip away and we discipline ourselves and we just do the right things the right way at the right time and we just keep going. And that discipline builds into our life and it changes our life. Maybe you're here this morning and you're one of those distracted people. Maybe you're the fourth one. Maybe you're here and you know that, man, you have persevered and you've gone on and your life right now is producing fruit for the kingdom and praise God for you. Can I encourage you? If that's you, you should be praying for the other people around you. Pray for other people in this church. Here's what I want to do this morning. I want these guys to, to, to lead us in a, in a song. I'm going to ask you to do something and it might be a bit confronting and you might be uncomfortable and that's okay. You don't have to do it. We don't control you. We don't make you do nothing. But here's the thing. Uh, we're not here to be spectators. If you're just here to hear something, hopefully have a chuckle and go home, missing the point. We're here to grow to maturity. We're here to do business with God. Here's what I want you to do. I would love you to just take 60 seconds if you're comfortable. Why don't you turn to, if not the person next to you, go find someone you're comfortable with. Why don't you explain to them, this is the soil I am right now. Can you pray for me? I, 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 haven't, I haven't started this journey, but you know what? I want to. And even if I don't want to bow my knee to Jesus right now, I want to start the journey of finding out the story. Is it real? Would you pray to this invisible Casper, the friendly ghost God of yours, that He would direct my steps and help me? If you're that second soil, then, then, then maybe you can go and say, you know what, I started, but I stopped. Pressure got to me and so on. But you know what? I need to get back on the horse. I need, I, I need to walk with Jesus. I know it's right. Would you pray for me? Maybe you're the third one. And you just know you've been distracted by things. And you want that distraction. You want to have the strength and the discipline to pull yourself back in and go, no, 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 I don't want to be distracted by all this stuff. Would you pray for me? Let's minister to one another this morning in this place. And maybe if you're producing fruit like there's no tomorrow, awesome, praise God. Or maybe you can go and tell someone, can you pray with me and just thank God for where I am right now? Because you never know, one day you could end up being distracted. Amen. Why don't we do that while these guys play? Just, just if you're comfortable. Grab someone. If you're not, not that comfortable to do that with someone else, then maybe just bow your head and do it with yourself. But I'm telling you, the Bible is so full of one another's. We are called as God's people to minister to one another. And this is an opportunity to minister to one another right now.